my presentation on the space race. Okay. And it was basically a competition between the United States and Soviet Union, which is now called Russia, for accomplishments in space as the technological age is really expanding in the 60s. And the space race was uh, linked into the Cold War, which was the tension between the Soviet Union and the United States during, after World War II. And while the Cold War may have been bad, the space race just did bring a lot of new technological accomplishments. Okay. And in uh, 1957, the space race started when the, U when the Soviet Union sent the Sputnik into space, and then just pretty soon afterwards, they sent the dog Laika into space, and she was the first living creature in space. And then in 1961, Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space, and he made an orbit around the Earth for the first time ever. In 1963, Valentina Cherovsky and Valeria Blasky are sent into this space and they were the first women to ever go into space. And in 1965, he did, Alex and did the first spacewalk, which is basically walking outside of a rocket ship. And in 1958, the U.S. sent a rocket a satellite into space, but this was done after many failures. In 1961, Alan B. Shepard was the first American man to ever go into outer space. In 1963, Ed White did the U.S.'s first spacewalk. In, and in 1969, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, or Buzz Aldrin, first landed on the moon. Okay, now I want to show a video of footage from the moon landing. Right. Now, you may not be able to hear here, but here... This is that the flag actually blew away as they were taking off. Yeah, people will think that they just. Now, so who really won it? 
Well, the Soviet Union definitely had a lot of firsts, like first rocket, first satellite, first living creature space, the first man in space, spacewalk. They had basically had all the firsts except for the moon landing, which was done by the U.S. The, the 1969 landing was definitely the hardest part of the space race and still considered one of the greatest accomplishments. Now, what did the space race pe people feel? They were, there was fear that space technology could be used to make nuclear weapons or be used to spy on people. There, people were also excited about what space technology could do and whenever one of these accomplishments took place, they were static and fascinated. And there was pride. A lot of the space race took place because of nationalism in 1963 when President Kennedy saw that we were boosting the space race. He made a speech saying that we needed to put a man by the moon for the end of the decade. And another thing was unity. When people saw the Earth on the on screen in 1969, it felt as though they were one whole world. Okay, last part. And what did it lead to? Well, it led to an era of space exploration. There were more moon landings in the 70s, but we haven't been back there since. It led to technologies such as Google Earth, and NASA still does great projects. One of the latest is the Dawn Project to study asteroids. And now there are talks of someday landing on Mars and setting up a colony. So we're in the 1960s drug culture. Uh, so why drugs? Um, it was one of the most influential, commercially successful, and critically acclaimed bands of the decade was the Beatles. So they were the most important of the 1960s. And their music career has been intricately, intricately linked with drugs from their early pre fame days. So they, it was seen that drugs were connected to them. And then, not only were the musicians trying the drugs, but most of their fans would use drugs while they were listening. And they were first introduced um, to pills in 1961 to keep them awake. And like during like all the lengthy shows that they would have, and then the Beatles used marijuana and LSD. And then the 1960s psychedelic era introduced the sound and musical content of music, which was dealing with rock music. And then drugs, and the music industry will always be connected. And this is just a timeline, basically, of the different like acts that happened during from 1914 to 1988. Um, the one 1960s is the manufacturing act. This is just a, a photo of the Grateful Dead. Uh, obviously, when listening to their music, you can tell, um, or visiting one of their shows, you can tell that drug use was definitely uh, one of the most prominent features. Um, in their performances and uh, had a great influence on the music. And, uh, so, yeah, this is explaining kind of the, the Grateful Dead's music. Um, it's uh, definitely a unique sound. They had a large following called the Deadheads uh, that still exists to this day. Um, large marijuana use and LSD use at the shows, just uh, a whole lot of going on. Um, these are different drugs that were used in the 1960s um, recreationally. So the first one includes like marijuana. Um, artists and uh, poets, musicians, and uh, use marijuana to influence like inspiration and um, creativity. In the 1960s, it was a symbol for um, rebellion against authority. And then in 1964, Bob Dylan introduced the Beatles to Canvas, which had a significant effect on their music. The Rastafari movement also included um, cannabis, which was like um, themes of spiritual, and there was uh, the theme of rejection of Western society, <coughs> which um, was in the regular music, and promoting this belief spread primarily <coughs> during the 60s. LSD. In the uh, early 1960s, LSD was considered promising treatments for a broad um, range of psychological and psychiatric conditions. Um, the Beatles converted their drug addiction to LSD, which had a profound effect on their songwriting and uh, recording. 
The band plays instrument, instrumental songs called Space at every concert that was created for people who are high on drugs, which stems from early days of LSD use. Not only were the band members using drugs, but um, also Alex Lee Stanley was a legendary LSD chemist that provided the group with a drug while they were performing gigs, and he actually um, overdosed on um, LSD. Um, during the 60s, many people took uh, mushrooms to get a new uh, perspective on the world. Um, I guess the example of this would be able to as well was uh, during the Beatles of the Sgt. Pepper's uh, album. That was a kind of example of them when they got more into LSD use because the music started getting more in the synths and then uh, kind of like bringing the food, um, Buddhism into their music too as well. Like, uh, George was a big fan of that. So it's like kind of a music change into that. And then um, 1960s, it became illegal because uh, two people had native trips. So of course, when you do mushrooms, you have to go into them knowing that you're going to have a good time because if anything bad happens to you while you're doing them as well, it kind of affects, it has such control over your brain that you can have, you know, a really negative trip and freak out and people, a lot of people actually die because they didn't realize where they were at or um, they just couldn't handle the situation. And, yeah, this is like some weird psychedelic we had for a photo of a mushroom. <laughs> Not actual mushroom, but yeah. <laughs> Um, another one is heroin, and it's an opium derivative, and there's a severe physical slash mental dependency on it when it's abused, and people are, they rely on it once they get addicted to it. And then um, it's an opium, not morphine, a derivative that was developed it's, as a painkiller. And then in some countries, it's available for prescription as a long-term use, which um, can replace therapy alongside of counseling. And in the 1960s, it was really common um, artists and like musicians would um, sort of go for heroin. Sorry. Um, but, yeah. um, another one is cocaine, and it's derived from the leaves of a cocoa plant, and it mostly affects your central nervous system. And it's usually distributed as a white crystalline powder, and it, the typical method of consumption is. So there's some links between the psychedelic art and music movement um, that were both heavily influenced by drugs. Um, the art was similar to the surrealist movement um, that prescribed a mechanism for obtaining inspiration. Um, there's also a mechanism for surrealism and the observance of dreams. Um, so people would have like trips that would be like lucid dreams that would be great inspirations for art and like that. Um, music evolved in the 60s as an offshoot of rock and roll, adding Eastern influence, including sitars and other instruments, stuff that sounded trippy, like opioids, um, and like influenced. Um, These are just like examples of some different bands that played during the 1960s that were very like influenced by drugs. Um, and there are a lot of pharmaceutical drug discoveries. First was the contraceptive pill, and it really promoted like the women's movement and women's rights because they finally had control over their body. And Valium, which was a muscle relaxer, and uh, it was said as a joke that most parents took them a lot, and in studies that show that a lot of parents did take them, and also vitamins. Um, I was I put this slide together, kind of showing uh, Pete Ashbury as the epicenter for the hippie movement. Um, it was just a huge um, congregation of people that came together that were all practicing this, this new subculture of drugs. Um, the 1960s kind of provided this platform for this to happen because of all the social change and progression that we've been hearing about all semester. Um, there are different movements across the country that really get tied into the new ideas in the South and the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and it was just progression and new thoughts and trying new things and new ideals. And this was at the center of the hip and the drug culture. So hi, my name is Dominique Blackwell, and um, my project is based on the 1960s, obviously, but comparing police brutality between then and now against blacks, and has it really changed, or like any changes you know, have been made to improve you know, the racial discrimination against blacks and, you know, tearing them down of, you know, based on the color of their skin and then dehumanizing them as well. So I just created a video. Um, me and my brother actually collaborated. He actually helped me. So we created our own beat. 
and two of my closest friends are actually singing or rapping and singing on the track. So then I also have a visual to give you a more warming feeling of, you know, to bring out the true, like how they felt with their lyrics. The lyrics are very, very personal to them and you know what they've been through and what they believe in. So I'm just showing you the showing the video and I hope you guys enjoy.
Thousand Chicanos held a rally outside of City Hall and protested for the release of San Castro and the 12 others arrested. I'm from ML, MLL 273, and I wrote a research paper on the role of the Catholic Church in the Dominican Republic and Spain. So what do you think when church comes to mind? I think of somebody that's, or an organization that's good, that's going to make the correct moral decision. So if I go to them for advice, they're going to give me the best um, advice possible. So just overall, a very good place to go. So why did the church in the Dominican Republic fight in this violent revolution against their dictator? And on the other hand, you have Spain who actually supported and chose this ruthless dictator. So to, in order for me to kind of explain the Dominican Republic and how the role of the church was, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about the dictator Trujillo. So Rafael Trujillo was born in 1891. He joined the military and was trained by the U.S. Marines because at the time the U.S. Marines was occupying that land, it's uh, Dominican Republic. He eventually became the commander of the police. He was elected president in 1930 with no opponents and he actually had more votes than were actually registered. So he ruled for 31 years. He got as much power as possible. There was no democracy, no freedom. He controlled everything. He used terror, surveillance, or the secret police um, to control everybody. He put people in prison. There were kidnappings, random disappearances. Um, so this basically caused him to be assassinated in 1961 because he was just this ruthless, horrible dictator. So the role of the Catholic Church in the Dominican Republic were obviously against Trujillo. Um, however, the Catholic Church had not always been against him. For most of his role, they actually supported him. They were kind of in an unofficial relationship. There were good ties, but they didn't want to be too close to him. So Trujillo would basically benefit the church. Um, he helped with schools, and in return, they kind of told the people that we support you. Um, however, he did have propaganda against the bishops, um, but he would, like, in the public eye, be like, no, I totally support the church, but behind the walls, he was not a big fan of them. So one of the reasons that the church, or he started to hate the church, is because he actually asked them to be called benefactor of the church, which basically means that he just wanted to be called the god of everything. And so they said no to him, and so that made him super angry. And he also found out about a plot that the bishops were speaking out against him. So he punished them, arrested them, and killed them. And so the Catholic Church sent them, or sent him, a list of human rights, basically telling him, like, if you go against any of these, like, this is a sin, this is not right. So that's when the Catholic Church started fighting against him. So in return, he burnt down the bishop's homes and churches were bombed. So overall, um, he, they were a voice for those without a voice. This dictator was just horrible to everybody and the church was the only one that was able to stand up against him, which kind of helped lead this revolution. So the bishops realized that his ways were sinful, so they did create awareness about not having human rights, and they mainly just wanted to help society and help in the revolution. On the other side of the spectrum, you have the Catholic Church, which supported their ruthless dictator, um, Francisco Franco in Spain. So Francisco Franco was born in 1892. He was also born into a military family. His father was authoritarian and horrible. He abandoned his family many times, and they actually say that that's what caused Franco to be the way he was, this horrible dictator, because of his father. 
he was considered Catholic and he always wanted to be noticed. He always wanted to be like out of the crowd. He also joined a naval school. He went up in the ranks, was able to command and lead very well. He became the youngest military general at age 33 and he led a rebellion against the Spanish Dem Democratic Republic in the Spanish Civil War. And he, his goal was just basically to overthrow the whole government and then take it for himself. So he used Adolf Hitler's techniques in order to do that. He did become the dictator of Spain and he ruled from 1939 to his death in 1975. So when he came into power, he just wanted to restore the nation after war. It was like such, like it was in ruins because of the war that he basically had this opportunity to shape Spain how he wanted it to be. So opponents were arrested, people were put in prison, they were executed. He also had that secret police for power, restricted civil and political rights, and he was, however, he was not as strict at the end of his world. So the role of the Catholic Church in Spain supported Franco and his regime. So after this Spanish Civil War, everything, like I said, was in ruins to where churches were destroyed and a lot of priests and bishops had died during this time. So there was not much faith among the nation. And so they decided that they were gonna work with Franco in order to become strong again. So there were advantages for both. Catholicism uh, legitimized Franco, which was his main strategy to getting the people to support him. And then in return, the government helped repair their churches. And so they basically used one another. Uh, they were a big factor in politics. It was this perfect balance. So together, they both wanted like this backwardness or to keep the traditional ways in Spain. So church was a strong unity tool. Um, surprisingly, Catholicism was the only religion allowed, so Franco would kill anybody who was not Catholic. Um, and so as a result of that, after Franco's death, when he died, um, it caused a decrease in religious practice because other people were realizing like, oh, we're actually transferring to a democracy now. I can believe in what I want to believe in. I don't have to be Catholic. So there was definitely a decrease. So overall, it's like they supported Franco this whole time and Franco supported them and they got their way. But when he died, they didn't really come out on top. It was almost like an illusion with their power that they were just relying on Franco so much that they didn't get it the right way. They didn't get the people's support the right way. They just basically used Franco. So overall, they were very different roles. One church kept their morals, one didn't. They were both put in difficult situations, but in my opinion, I think the Dominican Republic made the best decision because they didn't support this horrible dictator just so they could get the favor from their people. So I, my question is to you is, would you rather choose your ruthless dictator over your faith, or would you rather keep your faith and then fight against your ruthless dictator? Thank you. My name is John Moyles. I'm in uh, MLL 273 as well. And for my project, I wrote an essay about baseball in Cuba and the significant role it plays for its country throughout the country's history. So throughout Cuba's history, baseball serves, served as an integral part in rebellions against oppressing governments from the Spanish colonial era to the current Castro regime. During the time of Spanish rule, it served as a platform for rebellion and in recent decades until the present serves as a beacon of hope for the impoverished country. My essay focuses on the reign of the Castro regime that began in, at the end of the 1950s and continues into present day. To understand the impact it, of the li limitations Castro put on the baseball world of Cuba and the nation, one must first understand how baseball became part of the cultural fabric of the citizens of the nation and what it represents. So baseball was first introduced into Cuba in, in the 1860s by Cuban students returning from colleges in the U.S. and American sailors who ported in the country. And during this time period, Cuba was a Spanish country. The, the Spanish found no interest in baseball and referred to it as a rebel game. And baseball became symbolic of freedom to the Cuban people because baseball was clearly what distinguished them from, Cuba, from the Spaniards and this derived the deep passion and love for the game that became instilled in Cubans for generations to come. So when, a when Castro overthrew the Batista regime and came to power in July of 1959, he changed the course of history for decades to come. And when he came to power, he made professional baseball illegal in Cuba in 1960 and preferred a socialist model, not 
making the goal of money. And in 1962, the U.S. officially cut all ties with Cuba following the cash, Castro's alignment with the Soviet Union. With professional baseball banned in Cuba and no interaction with the U.S., uh, Cuban baseball players made an insignificant amount of money compared to the professionals in the U.S. One report found that most baseball stars made less than 2000 annually and that all players would receive sports league pay at the same rate that they would get from their off-season jobs as like carpenters or whatever they would do. And as a result, many, player, many players defected to the U.S. To, due to the deteriorating economic conditions. Amidst the defections, even Fidel Castro admitted himself that it's hard to prevent the baseball stars from defecting, quote, if you have to compete with six million against six million dollars versus three thousand Cuban pesos, you cannot win. Um, so, in December 2014, the United States and Cuba began to reopen diplomatic relations. MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred entered into discussions to hold an ex exhibition game between an MLB team and the Cuban national team. The Tampa, Ra Tampa Bay Rays played the Cuban national team on March 22, 2016 in Havana. The game was attended by U.S. President Barack Obama and Cuban President Raul Castro. And this was the first time a U.S. president had been to Cuba in nearly 88 years. However, it was hard to watch for the, it was hard to see for Cuban Americans who watched as the leader of the free world embraced the dictator that they had risked their lives to flee. One Cuban, Natividad Silva, an 85-year-old retired pharmacist fled Cuba in 1962 when the Castro regime seized her small business and life savings. She, like many others, began fearing for her life as innocent people around, in, around her in Havana were unjustly incarcerated, tortured, and killed. She had no choice but to flee, and her story is far from unique. Uh, she's the product of the cruel realities of the Castro regime and represents many of its subjects. The inspirational power that the United States holds to those standing up to totalitarianism is hard for those of us born here to, to understand. There is no other nation so active in its defense for, of freedom of expression, basic human rights, and democracy. The symbolism of the U.S. in standing for human rights has been tarnished because of this abandonment of Cuban pro-democratic advocates. President Obama says he wants to make sure make the last remnant of the Cold War disappear, but his visit will do the opposite. It ensures continued communist rule in Cuba by granting an economic lifeline and asserting a legitimacy to the Castro regime. It is ironic that the side of the, of the meeting between Obama and Castro took place at this exhibition game because of his appearance of the disappearance of the president enables the continued oppression of, player, of the players on the Cuban side and the hundreds of young Cuban men just like them, as well as the citizens. However, the unwavering determination of these Cuban players to defect and hopefully be blessed to receive an opportunity to showcase their talents on the biggest stage possible shows the, that shows the people that a better life is attainable regardless of the obstacles faced. These players who persevere against all, all odds and achieve greatness are living proof to many oppressed citizens of Cuba that change is possible regardless of the outcome and the political standing between U the U.S. and Cuba, with it or without, Cuban baseball players will continue to make their way into the MLB at all costs, and by doing this, expose everything wrong with the Castro regime, and they inspire the people of Cuba to fight for what they believe in and are passionate about. Thank you. So, our presentation is on fashion trends in Spain. So what was going on in Spain during the 1960s? Um, about this time, there was a lot of economic relief going on in Spain uh, at the end of the Fran Francisco Franco dictatorship. Uh, the reestablishment of diplomatic relations with the U.S. did help provide um, aid uh, through Spain's economic difficulties. So through the 20s, 30s, and 40s, they suffered with uh, food shortages and other shortages like for clothing and whatnot, and that was not uh, good for them. Um, Industrial production and the standard of living also increased uh, dramatically. Um, and this expansion was really based on the public investment uh, infrastructure and the opening of Spain as a tourist destination from other people um, in Paris, too. And yeah. 
So uh, women uh, during so uh, women during the Franco uh, dictatorship. So a lot of the laws at this time uh, limited women from what they could do, from getting a job, uh, owning property, or just leaving the house. Um, and some of the laws that really set their roles in the society were the permiso marital, which is a marital permission, uh, the perfecta casada, the perfect housewife, and the angel de hogar, which is angel of the home. And these uh, laws were just, they're just completely wrong. Um, I also read that if a uh, woman wanted to have a kid, she had to take like a six month course uh, from the government just to prepare for that. So that's just another reason why it's just not right. It's not messed up. Okay, so here are some of the changes that were noticed during the 60s. A ton of social values were changing. Um, like I said before, the dictatorship ended, so people wanted to get out of the norm. Um, the tension was increasing between the legal codes and the growing social reality, so a lot of those laws that I said earlier were part of those codes, and there was just, uh, you know, people wanted to break out of that. Um, and a lot of uh, increased flow from European uh, countries really did have a profound impact on their um, society, especially in the economy and fashion. And these are two of the top designers we focus on for this project, uh, Manuel Petregas and Cristobal uh, Balenciaga. They're two very prominent uh, designers in Spain. Uh, this is Manuel Petregas. He was considered um, one of the greatest Spanish fashion designers. He was born in 1916. I died 2014, and he's known for addressing some of the most famous uh, people internationally. So, he is really known for his elegant and classic styles. Um, he believed that elegance came from within the person and not from the dress on the person, so that really uh, separated him from other designers at the time. Uh, some of the people he did make dresses for were uh, Queen Letizia, Carmen Pola, which was actually Franco, Francisco Franco's uh, wife, the dictator, uh, Audrey Hepburn, and Jacqueline Kennedy. And in 1968, he was the first designer to open the first of five ready-to-go boutiques in Spain. So thank you for that. Here's a sequence jumpsuit he designed, worn by a Spanish youth model, Laura Ponti. Here's another uh, Pertegas design. Uh, you can see that his style is there with the box shape and like the lower skirt. And here is another 1969 sequence fringe uh, diva. So crazy thing, this, uh, when we were researching this, this whole outfit get up weighs about uh, 31 pounds. So just imagine sitting down, taking pictures for that. Must have been not so fun. Uh, here's the 64 couture silk cocktail dress by Pet the Guys. You could really see that he was obsessed with sleeves and really flashy <coughs> um, additions. And here is uh, an elegant couture wedding dress. So one of his uh, greatest works was, I think his last one in 2004, uh, he received a request to design a dress for, uh, yeah, the princess at the time, Letizia Ortiz. So that was officially his last thing he did. And here's the sketch, uh, the original sketch he had for the dress he designed. So you can see it took a lot of time to detail on that. And this is the dress she wore. Um, our next designer we focus on uh, was Cristobal Balenciaga. He was the supreme architect of the 20th, 20th century fashion. Here's just a quick, brief video of him and his work. These are two of the only photos Cristobal Balenciaga ever posed for. This is the wedding gown he made for Queen Fabiola of Belgium, 1960. These are his favorite fabrics. This is the headline that appeared when Balenciaga closed his house in 1968. But what exactly did he achieve in his life to earn such a headline? The self-taught masters in the Basque country dazzled Paris in the late 1930s with Spanish flair and deceptive simplicity. But it was really after the war, along with contemporaries Christian Dior, Pierre Balmain, and Jacques Fat, that Balenciaga really made his mark, introducing a new silhouette for women. 
and designs such as his first semi-fitted suit, the balloon dress, the sailor shirt, the barrel line, the baby doll, the sack dress. No outfit was complete without a hat. Models were forbidden to smile and instructed to look above the clientele. Balenciaga openings were serious and silent with all the attention on the collection. Textile rationing during wartime resulted in trim, straight designs, so Dior really shook things up with the cinched in waist and lavish use of fabric. In contrast, Balenciaga used his intense knowledge of tailoring and textiles to pursue new lines in women's fashion that still look and feel entirely contemporary today. Embroiderer Francois Lesage once remarked that he had a way of writing with scissors and cloth. Many others compared it to sculpture. He was obsessed with sleeves, in Spanish, la manga, and he always designed the cassocks for his priests. Ready to wear fashions, combine something of the panache of the big couturiers without so much strain on your purse strings. When Ready to Wear arrived in the 1960s, Balenciaga steered clear and continued to create work that never could be built with machines. Though he did design the stewardess outfit worn by Air France for 10 years, starting in 1969. He loved to ski. This was an outfit he designed for winter sports in his 1967 collection. He didn't care about the work being a reflection of his time. It was a reflection of himself. And the fact that he was able to maintain this relationship with the work so consistently for so many years may have been his greatest achievement of all. achievement was something called the revolution and this is when he designed all of these um, designs the baby doll dress the semi-fitted suit the balloon dress the sailor shirt and the sack dress um, he radically altered the way women looked and felt with his um, designs and he was he fashioned a new silhouette which um, featured open neck and wide collar creations In 1960, he transformed his uh, fabric use and he used bold materials, heavy cloth, and ornate embroidery for his creation. Um, here are two pieces he made, and this is a 1965 silk dress, and the one on the right is a 1967 evening ensemble. Um, here you can see the embroidery that he used and the technique he was really um, known for. And a couple other pieces he made were hats and like the video said, every um, outfit wasn't complete without a hat. Um, another one of his great accomplishments was the dress he designed for um, the future queen of Belgium in 1960. So I wrote a realistic fictional novel, or a short story, on how the dictator of the Dominican Republic, Rafael Trujillo, affected uh, families. Um, I'm just going to read uh, the last chapter, but before I get into that, um, my main character, Marcel Didier, he was a doctor, and he had a wife and a son. So, Lolo grabs Abe on the collar before he trips into the planter in the front yard. Abe is named after Abraham Lincoln and Marcel's son, due to the huge interest Marcel has gained in American politics and history over the years. There has always been a slight desire to migrate to the United States for the Didiers, but Marcel also has very strong values of nationalism, a value his father taught him <coughs> and demonstrated through his childhood. His father always said how he wanted to see the Dominican Republic grow and prosper before his eyes. Unfortunately, there was no improvement in sight with Trujillo and his regime. And as of late, he has seemed to show less and less mercy. Marcio was losing patience. Dr. Patience, no. Okay. <laughs> Trujillo was making threats to those who disobeyed and was followed up by a lot of disappearances among those citizens who decided not to follow his exact orders. Marcio did feel conflict and often was scared when working with a patient for everything he was providing was illegal and unprohibited. Before he worked with a patient, he reminded 
he reminded them that what they were doing could put them in potential danger, but most of his patients were that of the not-much-to-lose group. Marcio's busy days did de decrease as Trujillo made his presence known on a larger scale, and some felt it was a matter of time before Marcio was caught, but he said he would take his chances. It was close to four o'clock when Marcio said goodbye to his last client of the day. As he walked him out, he heard a very strong rumble of an engine. He thought it could have been Lola and Abe returning from errands on the day, but it was a Jeep that took a sharp turn into their driveway, followed closely by a black Cadillac. Marcio noticed, narrowed his eyes and made out the Dominican flag on the license plate. He felt his heart sink as he watched the two cars pull forward directly in front of his porch, kicking up dust and disrupting the fresh air. Time seemed, time seemed, excuse me, time seemed to have sped up for Marcio. When the dust cleared, he was confronted with an officer starting up the stairs of his porch. The officer was tall and lengthy, his arms draped past, far past his waist, almost to his knees. When he reached the same level as Marsu, he lowered and he lowered his eyes and asserted, El Jefe would like a word. Marsu bowed his head and turned for the door, leaving it halfway cracked for the men to follow. He walked through to the living room and uh, sat down. From the quick glance, it was as if Trujillo could specu speculate nothing about illegal practice, but Marcio felt that Trujillo was not here just for a quick peek. The steps Trujillo took seemed to have been amplified, and the breaths Marcio had taken began to get shorter. He got up and stood before Trujillo and his three men. Trujillo held, up, held out his hand to shake Marcio's. A small jingle from the medals on his chest masked some of the terrific silence. Trujillo took a loud sigh as he looked around Marcio's humble home. Please sit down, Mr. Didio. Marcel sunk into his chair and crossed his leg. He, sur he surveyed his living room as Trio cleared his throat and began to speak. What's important to you, Mr. Didier? Marcel was slightly taken back by Trio's calm presence when asking this question. But with careful thought, he picked up his head and looked into Trio's eyes. I care about the wellness of others. Trio tilted his head slightly and stood up. He moved over to the mantle and began to observe the photos of Marcio's family and the memorial picture of his father. He lingered for a bit and then turned around. Mr. Didier, <clears throat> does you wanting safety for others mean you put other, would, would mean put, excuse me. Mr. Didier, does you wanting safety for others mean you put some at risk? Marcel stammered, most certainly not. Trujillo reached towards the ottoman and picked up the face down photo that was gathering dust. He blew off some of the dust and slowly read the caption. En el casa Trujillo es el jefe. This was a photo of El or Trujillo that all families were required to have. He pulled back his shoulders and looked at Marcio. Marcio had a flood of a flood of rush, a red. Marcio had a flood of red rush over his face. His body was filled with a heat he couldn't shake. Trujillo bellowed the caption once again and then proceeded to throw the picture across the room at Marcio. The frame struck his forehead and fell to the floor, shattering the glass casing. Marcio was dazed as Trujillo rushed over to the side, rushed over to Marcio's side to interrogate him, but not before Marcio picked up a glass shard about as large as a butter knife off the floor and hid it under his sleeve. Trujillo sat Marcio back down and knelt in front of him. Without cooperation, there is no society. Without society, there is no more of the Dominican Republic. Marcio tilted his head up with a look of smug disapproval. Trujillo continued, for you to be running an illegal practice would mean that you have taken the lives of the Dominican people in your own hands. Marcio butted in, I'm providing things that your health care doesn't cover. I'm benefiting this country rather than destroying it. One of Trujillo's guards punches Marcio in the stomach. As Marcio doubles over, he feels the glass shard come, become loose in his hand. Trujillo grabbed Marcio by the cheek and looked him over. Anyone against this regime is an enemy one who doesn't want to see this nation thrive. I begin to wonder what kind of people raised such a naive and undisciplined individual. Marcio felt his throat swell up and began to feel uncomfortable in his own skin. He couldn't comprehend how such a man could be so manipulative. Since the death, death of his father at the hands of Trujillo, there has been a void in Marcio's heart and mind. Rafael Trujillo had been the base of fear for Marcio since he was 14, providing total, total control and fear without directly doing so. Marcio was disgusted with this intense power and felt it needed to come to an end. His father always said that in order to change something so static, the adjustment had to be drastic. Marcio wanted to see the country change before his eyes, and it certainly did after he drove the fragment of glass from the picture flame through Trio's neck. Thank you.
Okay, so me and Jessica did a chitlin circuit. So what are chitlins? Chitlins are pig intestines, and it is an economic dish, so it is pretty inexpensive, but it takes a lot of time for them to prepare since they have to be properly cleaned. And a chitlin circuit is a collective name for all the venues that African Americans were allowed to perform at. Okay, so to actually we, there's a lot of ways you can make chitlins. You can fry them, you can make them in a soup, or we actually boil them and we didn't fry them. But yeah, those are some of the ingredients that we used to give it more flavor because there's a lot of different ways you can prepare them. Our first attempt, it was pretty hard for us to find pig intestines, so we found beef guts, thinking that maybe that would have a similar flavor and maybe be a similar dish, but it turns out that was not the same at all, <laughs> so we, we weren't sure how much we were supposed to buy. We only bought a pound and they turned out very small. Okay, and then that was our second attempt. That was already, we, okay, we had to wash them and it stunk up the house really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and the odor was on our hands for like a whole day. It just would not come off. <laughs> but yeah, then we had to boil them for a long, really long time. They had to boil for three to four hours. <laughs> and then the finished product, popular side dishes that go along with chitlins are cornbread or okra, which are also spicy. 